Um, I've just introduced myself differently from Simon. Uh, so I'm Alistair Campbell, Director of Accessibility at Nomensa. Uh, I have a background in psychology, uh, usability, um, user research, and quite a lot of front-end code, which did chuck me into the, the accessibility sphere fairly early. Um, so I'm not particularly going to talk about why accessibility is important. I'll talk a little bit about it, but I'm going to try and do a quick intro, well, as quick an intro as I can get away with, basically, and get straight on to the how. Um, so I'll start with how I see sort of accessibility fitting into digital projects. And I mean, accessibility in, in digital terms is um, about how people with disabilities or how easily people with disabilities can use um, your website, application, digital product. Um, but it affects a lot more people. So there are around one billion people in the world, or one in five people in the UK, according to government stats, who have a disability, some kind of permanent disability. There's a lot more who benefit from when you, take, when, when you try and integrate accessibility into your products on a temporary basis. This is from Microsoft's Inclusive Design Kit. Um, so, you know, somebody who can't see might have, uh, you know, sort of cataracts or be, you know, a distracted driver. Um, I did find it interesting they skipped the whole sort of cognitive part of this, and I thought maybe that's because the only thing they could think of that's a temporary cognitive disability is a hangover. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so I do see accessibility as a, a sort of a, a part of usability. It's how easily people can use something. However, there are many technologies that people use to adapt things to themselves that you might not be aware of. Uh, and there's, uh, there's quite a lot of them. So the platform standards are really helpful to define who's responsible for what. You know, what does your website need to do and what does the person's technology need to do? Um, I'll do one show of hands. Who works in a place where you try and sort of um, work with accessibility guidelines or standards? OK, good. Quite a few. More than I expected, actually. Um, so I'm going to focus a bit on the platform standards or the accessibility guidelines, essentially. But I have to put a big uh, sort of caveat in place first. I Generally, when I do training and things, I don't start with um, guidelines. Because if you imagine you're in a wheelchair and you get to this lovely accessible button that's within reach and the door automatically opens for you, <laughs> It's not a great experience. And that's the kind of thing I see when people take a sort of checklist mentality. So if you try and just you know, get this checklist and tick things off at the end of a project, stuff like that happens. So um, what I do is, uh, when I do training and things, I run through four sort of tentpole interaction styles. So I, I treat it as different ways of interacting with technology. Um, so if you can't uh, use a mouse, you uh, have to use a keyboard, so that's mobility impairments and things, uh, and voice input. If you uh, can't see very well, you might need to make stuff bigger, so you zoom in on websites. Um, if you can't see at all, you might use a screen reader, and that's all about including sort of structure and metadata in the page. And then um, if you uh, have some kind of cognitive impairment or language issues, um, for example, if you're deaf, English might be a second language, um, then uh, people might get lost very easily. So there's a lot of sort of usability aspects in that. And when I run through sort of training workshops and we go through each of these interaction styles, and then I ask people, um, do, I do a little exercise, and ask people to say, when in your process could you define how these are going to work? So, you know, when are you going to define the headings, the keyboard order, that sort of stuff? And people tell me it's pretty early in the process. So um, I'll tweet out some links later. In the last presentation, uh, I, or the last talk I did at a conference, it was about how UX had failed accessibility by not considering it early enough in the process. So um, just as an example, getting people, even at a really sort of early sketch stage, to define what the page structure and um, sort of metadata in the page is going to be for people using a screen reader. Uh, and as an example of how that works, I have no idea if the sound's working on this, and it doesn't need to, but it might be too loud. So taking a sort of gov.uk with a screen reader and 
you can bring up um, the sort of sections of the page that gives you shortcuts, and you can skip between headings um, using keyboard shortcuts. And that's all just based on structure and metadata within the page. And you can tack that on towards the end, uh, you know, in the sort of development stage of the process. Uh, but it is a lot more elegant if you consider it earlier in the process and it's defined when you know, the page structure is defined. So whilst I do try and move the thinking about accessibility further forward in the design process, testing is a necessary and useful part. And broadly, there's sort of two main types of accessibility testing. There's with people and there's against guidelines. There are also sort of review, review tools and automated tools that can help speed up the process, but ultimately those are based on the guidelines. So they become fairly important. So usability testing with people with disabilities, it's kind of the gold standard um, in terms of knowing whether something's going to work or not. Um, but it is a bit more complex uh, in terms of running testing because of the various technologies people use. It's great for prioritizing issues. Um, and learning and getting buy-in from stakeholders um, who literally see people struggling and usually see that it's needlessly struggling because there are just little things that haven't been done. But again, it's very difficult to cover um, large, you know, sort of areas of your website. Uh, people will get through between two and five scenarios um, in a typical testing session, and that might not cover very much of your website. And even within a page, they might not cover everything within a page. So it doesn't give you the whole, whole sort of picture um, when you're running that. Um, it also means you need a reasonably finished product to actually test with. Um, so you have to leave it quite late in the process, in which case, again, it becomes more expensive. So testing with guidelines basically means sitting down and examining a page. Um, the ones I've got on screen are based on the sort of international guidelines, but they were customized to this organization to say, here is how we apply these guidelines. Um, it can be sped up with certain tools, but it is essentially <coughs> a manual process, otherwise you'll miss things. And then automated testing, you know, there's options for sending a robot uh, around your website to scan it and report back on issues, um, which is great for, you know, how wide a coverage you get. Um, but it can only cover between sort of 30 and 50% of the issues that could come up. So you are still missing quite a lot. So we have a range of usability and accessibility issues. Um, and as I said, usability testing with people will find the sort of biggest range, but you might not get very much coverage. So the vertical axis um, is sort of coverage. Automated testing, uh, you know, gets you great uh, breadth of coverage, but not very good depth. Uh, so this sort of manual audit or um, review with the guidelines sits in quite a good sweet spot of bang for your buck. Um, if you take a good sample of the different types of content, different layouts that you have, it can get you quite good coverage and find mo almost all of the accessibility issues that aren't sort of usability. So um, that sort of brings me on to what is WCAG? Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, so I'll start off with where they come from, because I often sort of talk about this and people have no idea. Um, it comes from the World Wide Web Consortium, which is an organization formed by Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web. Um, and he has a kind of benevolent dictator status there. <laughs> He's in charge. Um, it shepherds web standards like HTML and CSS and the accessibility guidelines. Um, and that's because right from the start, his vision was, this is for everyone. You know, the seven billion, not the six. Um, it's a membership organization. So the people who do the work at the W3C aren't employed by the W3C. They're um, from companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple, um, and specialist organizations like Mensa. So back in the early days, there were no accessibility guidelines. So governments who wanted some means of assessment had uh, nothing to go to. Uh, there was a big danger in the early days that there would be lots of national, different national-based guidelines. So the W3C works on this. So where they started was looking kind of at the whole ecosystem and realizing that if you've got users on the left, they use some kind of technology, usually a browser, to access a website. You have the website, 
and you have the tools that actually make the website. So they started off with three sets of guidelines. Um, user agent is browsers and whatever the person is using. The website content guidelines and the authoring tools. Um, but the, um, the ones that really took off were the web content guidelines, probably because there are you know, billions of websites now, not that many browsers and not that many authoring tools. So the web content ones were the ones that really took off and got used um, by governments and things. So to focus on those, um, they became more important because testing with user agents and all the different technologies people use gets quite difficult. So starting with the browsers, this is what most people use to access websites. But then when we consider different access technologies, we've got several screen readers, and each works with one or more browsers, um, sometimes three, and you get different bugs in each combination. You have uh, different screen magnifiers, and they, some of those have functionalities that adapt the website as well as just making things bigger. Um, for example, you know, reading things aloud when you click on them. And there are many different input methods, from uh, voice input, Dragon Naturally Speaking, to buttons, you know, one-button interfaces, like Stephen Hawkins uses, you know, he twitches a cheek and it selects things on his screen. So there's lots of input methods, and actually, they all work together as well in various forms. So it makes, you know, the sort of matrix of browser testing look like child's play. So we need some kind of way to ensure that we can test a website without spending all our time on these different combinations of technologies. So the way uh, it sort of started off was taking lots of different sources of issues. So usability, with, usability testing with people who have disabilities, um, surveys, research, uh, and just sort of general experience. Uh, and then what tends to come out of that is lots of user requirements. So um, a user with X disability needs to be able to do Y. Uh, but then they get filtered, so it has to be you know, feasible, it has to apply, apply across different web technologies, and it has to be transformed into a content requirement. So I'll give an example of that. The kind of thing people come up with to start with is, if you remember our sort of skipping headings one, um, for screen readers, uh, you know, users should be able to skip, uh, navigate by headings and lists when appropriate. Um, unfortunately, that sort of requires you to know how a user does things. It's quite technology specific, and it means you have to decide you know, when that's appropriate. The second example is actually from the guidelines, um, and it, I would admit it's more difficult to understand, um, but it, it's more workable. So um, what it's basically saying is that for every widget on the page, it's using the appropriate structure. If something looks like a heading, make it a heading. It's sort of more powerful, um, and it's also a magnitude easier to test. And it's more stable, because if HTML, for example, updates, you don't have to update this guideline. You just use the HTML appropriately. And to give you a little sort of guided tour of the current WCAG 2.0, um, there are four principles uh, and 12 guidelines. And those are basically just categories. The thing people think of as the guidelines is these success criteria which are testable statements about web content. And at the sort of AA level, there's 38 of those. So it's not actually huge amounts. Um, you can print them out in about 15 pages. Um, and they're not much bigger than that one in general. Uh, people ask about the sort of what's this AAA, AAA. So you can think of it as must, should, could. Um, most uh, government and commercial organizations aim for AA. And when, when these guidelines were created, the basic sort of principle was the, the, the bigger an issue for the user it is, the higher it goes. But the bigger issue it is to implement, the lower it goes. Um, that sort of about sums it up. And I will point out, if you do look at them, please do, um, the most important link for every guideline is that understanding one. Don't click on the how to meet. That's too complicated. Go to the understanding one, because then you get a page that is reasonably easy to understand, tells you what it's trying to achieve and how you test it. So um, why am I talking about this now? What's, what's happened? So WCAG 2.1 has been announced. After 10 years, you know, the last update was in 2008, so this has been a long time coming. 
Um, and why update? So uh, I would say most of WCAG 2.0 was written in about 2006. And then what happened? Uh, touch screens have become a lot more mainstream. I mean, it wasn't actually a problem from an accessibility point of view for a few years. Uh, but uh, you know, things like JavaScript frameworks have come out that are single page applications, don't reload the page. Those change things quite a lot. Um, they're not necessarily a problem, but they are very different. And there were also some notable gaps for people with cognitive disabilities and people with low vision. So taking a little step back, over the history of computing, there's been sort of several major changes that have been big concerns for people with accessibility requirements. For example, in the beginning, there was a command line, uh, and there were screen readers for that. So um, when the GUI sort of became popularized in the 90s, Anyone using a screen reader was pretty worried. How's it going to work? How's it going to get around this thing? But standards for the applications were invented and methods were found. Screen readers work fine with that now. Similar thing happened with mobile phones. So there were uh, assistive technologies for phones with buttons, and that was all sort of fine. And then suddenly, this blank screen came along from an accessibility point of view. How the hell's that going to work? But actually, um, Apple invented a touchscreen interface-based screen reader, and it's very highly regarded. It's probably one of the most used screen readers in the world. And fairly soon, we're going to have another change of interface. I'm quite looking forward to trying out the, um, uh, is it VR or AR? And um, there's a, a stand outside about this. So I'm not sure how this is going to work from an accessibility point of view. Um, at the moment, it requires vision, hearing, complete you know, mobility. Um, but input-output independence is a sort of core principle in usability that all the big companies know about. So I'm not actually that concerned about the accessibility going forwards. There are lots of different interfaces people can use to do the same thing. So why I'm talking about this now is that the WCAG 2 guidelines should, and I will have to heavily caveat this, should be released about this time next year. Um, at the moment, there is a public working draft that everyone can see, and we're going through a sort of monthly iteration process. Um, they've sort of been, um, yeah, we started off with uh, three task forces, mobile, cognitive, and low vision. They come up with lots of requirements. They mostly got converted to content requirements, so we're still working on that. And uh, there's actually about 29.30 being worked on at the moment. So WCAG 2.1 will be quite a bit bigger than 2.0. Um, it is all up in the air at the moment. Um, there are many possible criteria, and I cannot guarantee what is going to get into 2.1. But I would like to give you a flavor. So um, the mobile task force came up with quite a few, and it became more of a sort of input output task force. So they also looked at how things like voice input work, um, not just on sort of mobile devices. So a lot of their work is about how, how these new sort of sensors are going to work um, and not exclude people, essentially. So most of them are about that and touchscreen usage. And just as an example, we've got orientation. So this is one of the new guidelines. And it basically says, don't block the orientation. Uh, it's fairly easy to demonstrate. Um, you can do this now. It's a fairly sort of new thing in um, web technology, but it does let you lock the orientation. Please don't unless you really need to. Um, a really simple example, this gentleman is a CEO of a software company. He's also quadriplegic. So he, can't, he literally cannot turn his phone around. So if you lock the orientation, that's, he's really going to struggle with that. Uh, there's a good video on from WWDC about this guy. Um, there's also things like keyboard shortcuts. Um, so Gmail, for example, implements lots of keyboard shortcuts, so you can press, well, it's probably J and K for previous and next. Um, but if you use voice input and uh, somebody walks in and you say, hi, Bob, and it triggers off H-I-B-O-B, -B, you have no idea what's just happened. So um, if you do implement keyboard shortcuts, that's fine, but allow people to turn it off, as Gmail does. So there's quite a few low vision criteria as well. 
um, which basically orient around making things bigger and having good contrast. So um, content can be zoomed. And this one went through a few iterations. So it started off as let people zoom in to, you know, by 400%. And then somebody asked, from what starting point? How, how wide is their screen? So um, it sort of got translated to make sure content works when it's 320 pixels wide, which happens to be sort of small mobile screen. And that's very, um, very intentional because when you do that on a responsive website, this is what happens. We get the mobile version, which is much, much better from a low vision point of view compared to it scrolling off the side. And there are things like um, adaptable text. Uh, this one's slightly more controversial because it's slightly more difficult. Um, but things like allowing people to adjust line spacing, uh, sort of horizontal spacing, font family, and colors. And it's not that the website has to implement this. It's that the website has to allow the user to do it. So taking a site like BBC, uh, running a sort of user side script that applies their preferences can get you a completely different sort of color scheme and fonts and things. So the kind of stuff that you would need to worry about is maybe how icons are, um, are applied. So if the user overrides fonts and you're using font icons, that's when you get those squares. But uh, things like SVG are fine. So um, it's, it's a more difficult one, and there's still work to do on that. Um, things like graphics contrast. There, are, there is a current contrast guideline in WCAG uh, 2.0, but it only applies to text. So when you have things like uh, sort of icons that um, you have to understand to, to um, access functionality, uh, if they don't have text with them, somebody who can't see it can't use it. So as a simple example, um, I took Microsoft. There's plenty of images, but there's only two that are actually relied on. So the um, shopping trolley icon in the top right and the sort of play and pause, now they're black and white, so I'm not going to even test the contrast on those. Um, but the shopping uh, trolley one is kind of a grey on white and it's a little bit under the guidelines. So when you look at it and imagine you can't see too well, that's quite difficult to pick up. So uh, there is now a contrast guideline for graphics. And then cognitive is uh, the most difficult one because there's so much overlap with usability and a lot of the criteria do impact on um, how a website would uh, look to everyone. So there is some uh, difficulty getting some of these through. For example, um, there's a personalization one about being able to add icons and things. And somebody put together a very, very basic sort of proof of concept. So, uh, this website has lots of options across the top, but the idea is that the person comes to the website with certain um, preferences, which are sort of reported by their browser, and the website can either sort of pick that up and apply them, or put metadata in that lets the user do it at their end. And what the impact would be is doing things like adding icons to known functionality, like the home button, um, and reducing options, so literally sort of taking away things that the website considers aren't as important. And then we, at uh, the guidelines level, have to work out <laughs> how you define important. So those ones are uh, more difficult uh, and is definitely going through a public review process at the moment. So what's next? <coughs> what do you do with this information? So what I would note, first of all, is that big companies, Microsoft, Google, Apple, see accessibility and inclusive design as a commercial advantage. They have really got into it in the last sort of five, 10 years. Um, and they've all committed to building accessibility into their platforms, including things like games platforms like Xbox. You know, that has a magnifier built in. Um, they aren't always perfect in, in what they do, but the change over the last 10 years has been fairly dramatic. And they're not doing this for social reasons, they're doing it for commercial reasons. So the advice I would give to any sort of organization or sort of management who uh, either you know, don't know where you are with the accessibility or know that you need to do more 
I would start with some kind of training, just to ensure that the team understand the core requirements. Um, so not starting the guidelines, necessarily, um, but getting a sort of good idea of how different people use technology. Uh, and once you have that understanding, the guidelines become a really useful shortcut to including accessibility through your um, sort of whole process. So what I would recommend is working out who and when things should apply. Sorry, who should do things and when they should be applied. Um, and making sure it's integrated, making it baked in. So if you have brand guidelines, pattern libraries, other sort of developer documentation, making sure that when people pick things up from that, it's already accessible. So your brand guidelines have good color contrast options. Um, you know, pattern libraries have thought about accessibility. And then just working out what to um, sort of test and ensure is included at each stage of a project. For, you know, right from, well, really requirements, design, development, uh, people putting content into websites. And test little and often. So if you leave all the testing to the end, that tends to be expensive. Um, but if you check what needs checking as you go along, it's a lot less of an overhead. Um, and feed the results back into your sort of artifacts and processes. So when you find <coughs> issues, you know, say color contrast, feed that back into the brand guidelines and your pattern libraries. So uh, eBay have done this already. They've um, got what they call their mind uh, pattern library, which I think is messaging, input, navigation, and disclosure. This is just one example from the form sort of validation. And it just starts off with, here's how you do it. And then it's got all the sort of uh, branding, design, development uh, aspects. And it's all already been checked for accessibility. So um, whilst um, worker guidelines have to apply to any web content, you can make them much more focused and understandable by saying, here is how we apply them in our organization, and then using those. Uh, for people who are already familiar with accessibility and the guidelines, I would recommend going and having a look at the draft. It's public, it's there. Um, anyone can go and have a look, and anyone can comment. It is, it's run like an open source project. Um, issues go onto GitHub, and anyone can post them. In fact, you will find me there. Uh, so yeah, I'm part of the working group, um, and we are, you know, working on it a lot. But there's a lot to do. So I do encourage everyone to come and have a look, and um, post questions, post issues, um, or just get up to speed. So um, thank you very much. I will be here all day and happy to talk accessibility with anyone. If I happen to be on my laptop, it's just because I'm posting links up about this presentation. So if you didn't take notes, don't worry. I'm going to post links about it. Um, and uh, thank you very much.